Lord. First of all, Lord, first of all, first of all, COVID go. COVID go. You've outlived your welcome. You've outlived your welcome. You've outlived your welcome. Go in Jesus' name. Be gone in Jesus' name. Totally gone in Jesus' name. And those who are affected by it, we say healing and wholeness in Jesus' name. Raise everyone up, Lord. No matter what the comorbidities are, raise them up in Jesus' name. And heal the comorbidities as well in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, concerning the elections, it ain't over till it's over. We place it in your hands. You are the one who will make the call. You have made the one that you have chosen. And so, Lord, if there's evil about, uproot it all. Uproot it all. We leave it in your hands. You are well able. And Lord, concerning this nation, regardless of what happens politically, concerning this nation, turn our hearts toward home, toward the ancient boundaries, the foundational markers. Turn our hearts back. It's been 400 years since the Mayflower Compact was signed. Turn our hearts back toward those ancient covenants. Lord God, you chose this nation and you gave it a destiny. It will not be derailed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring an awakening. Bring a harvest in Jesus' name. We thank you for the turning. And we realize, Lord, even though, even though you want to offer mercy, and even though it's our desire for mercy, it may take judgment for people to be saved. So with fear and trepidation, we know that judgment begins in the house of God and that the church, the ecclesia, is under examination. And so, Lord, we want to do our part to agree with you for what you want to do in this earth, specifically in our lives, in the lives of our ecclesia, in the lives of our state and our nation and the nations, Lord. May people be saved. We pray that everything of the devil would be exposed and broken completely so people are free of his control and his influence so they might see Jesus clearly and embrace him. We pray for people to be saved. We pray that people who have been under the influence of darkness would have a mighty testimony in Jesus' name. And we just pull down strongholds. We pull down authorities in high places. We pull them down in Jesus' name. Jesus, be glorified. Jesus, be glorified. May your glory cover this earth as the water covers the sea in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that's all I'm going to say about that, too. So, okay, there we go. The chapter, the second sign. I like that. That's beautiful. The second sign. We're in John. John uh, has a theme that goes through it with signs. Our, uh, our scripture, where we're heading is John 4, 54. It's the NIV. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. So some of you have technology, but some of you have a real leather-bound book with pages that you can say, ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> book with pages. Um, I'm just going to thumb through John real quick because it's important to see where we are in the flow of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, y'all know, go together, and they cover a lot of the similar types of story, uh, stories. And John has a book that looks different than the witnesses of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John has an objective. And so let's, let's just remind ourselves. In the beginning is how he starts his gospel. And he's not talking about the birth of Jesus. He's talking about in the beginning. When God created things, Jesus was there. And he was the word that created. And he goes on and talks about it tabernacling among us. And that chapter 1 ends with him calling disciples to him. Right? So that's all in chapter 1. Chapter 2 we looked at last week. On the third day, which is a signal that's really cool, 
that says a lot of cool things, but I'm not going to get in that because that was last week, but probably just means Tuesday, right? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the third day. Good day for a wedding in Jewish times because when you look at what God says on the third day, he mentions blessings twice. And so people thought that's a good day because there's a double blessing on the third day. And then also it gave people time to get to a wedding have a lot of party, party celebration, and get back where they needed to be before Sabbath. And so he does that thing, changing the water to wine, and let, let me mention this. I'll, I'll get back to it, but no, let me save it. He changes the water to wine. Goes on through, goes to the other end of the extreme, and makes a whip out of cords and clears the temple when he goes to Jerusalem. It's like, I'm here, you know, like, are you going to announce you're here? Yes, I am. I'm going to clear the temple. Some, sometimes you think that's at the end. It is. It's at the beginning and the end. He does it twice, beginning and the end, clears his house. They ask for a sign. And he says, I'll give you a sign. Tear this temple down and I'll raise it on the third day. And, of course, they made fun and mocked because they thought he was talking about the temple, the physical building, but he was talking about his body. And, and John even says, you know, we didn't understand. But after the resurrection, we went, oh, yeah, he said he was going to do that. <laughs> you know, their, their eyes uh, were opened. If you go into chapter 3, Nick at night, Nick comes to Jesus. He's a teacher of the people. He's got some genuine questions. I don't like to get on him because he comes at night because during the daytime there were lots of crowds around. And yes, he could have been seen coming and there may have been that and coming at night, but also it gave him a chance for a private discussion and meeting and appointment, you know, kind of thing. And we've got John 3.16 embedded in that and all kinds of cool things. You go on past that um, and you get into... John and Jesus baptizing. But Jesus is not doing the baptizing. His disciples are doing the baptizing. And that set up some stuff. And that's sort of where John chapter 3 is ending with John talking about Jesus. He said, remember, I didn't say I was the one, he's the one, all this kind of thing. So now chapter 4. Oh, actually, that's the starting off with the baptizing, isn't it? He, uh, he goes through Samaria, has the encounter with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman who had gone out there to be totally away from all the crowds because she didn't want the ridicule and didn't want to feel condemnation, goes running back and becomes an apostle to her her city, says, come see this man who told me everything I ever did. And they come out and they said, first we believed because of what you said, now we believe because we've heard him. And y'all check me, go and look, but I don't believe that it says Jesus did any miracles when he was with them. Now he may have, but it, I think it says that he's teaching Will somebody just look and see? Just scan it real quick. Does it say he does any signs, wonders, miracles while he's with the Samaritans? Or does it just say he's there teaching? Anybody see? Just teaching. So then he says, okay, guys, we've been here in Samaria. Remember, they didn't want to go. Grady Nutt used to say, but, but there'll be Samaritans. <laughs> yeah, right because they were used to going around and Jesus went right through, had that appointment at Jacob's well and did that thing, spent the time with the Samaritans. So then he goes on to Galilee, heading down. There's the little thing about doesn't go back to Nazareth because a prophet is without honor. Remember, they tried to kill him at Nazareth when he, when he uh, did his last sermon at Nazareth. They tried to push him off the cliff down into the valley of Jezreel, which is Armageddon. Wanted to kill him there. And uh, so prophet without honor. So he heads back to Cana of Galilee. He's on the way to Capernaum. 
but he heads back to Cana of Galilee, lands in Cana of Galilee, where John, remember, he has done miraculous things. There have been signs, but John hasn't been reporting them all. I mean, he says, he says things have been happening. Pe people have seen him do things in Judea, and people have been following and everything, but he's gone back down to Galilee, spent that time in Samaria, said what he did about a prophet without honor, and then goes to Cana of Galilee where he did that first thing. So let me go back and just mention the, the wedding banquet one more time. So John calls that his first sign. Now John, again, mentions a lot about signs in his gospel, and there's already been the thing of the Pharisees saying, what sign will you give that you're the Messiah? And all of that kind of thing. And now Jesus actually says in the, the passage we're going to look at today, which is verse 45 through 54, he'll actually say, Jews want a sign. So, so Jesus gave plenty of signs, but what is it about these signs that John is saying first sign, second sign? There's got to be something about these signs. Well, first, Jesus is at this wedding in Cana of Galilee. Probably somebody he knows maybe is related. We've talked about that. And he brings this gaggle of, of teenagers with him, eating everything and drinking everything. So they're there. His mom comes to him and says, they're out of wine. He says, what's that got to do with me? Not my time. And she just looks at the servants and says, do what he says. Just tell him I'm busy right now. Thank you, John. That's okay. Yeah, it's all right. It could be important, you know. So, Jesus, I don't know if he did. Danny has a tendency. I told you all this last week. Danny has a tendency. Peggy says, Danny, do such and such. Now Angie says, Danny, do such and such. And when Angie turns around, I go, I do it in front of Peggy because she's your mama. But you learn with your wife, don't do it while she's looking. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and I mean that in the best possible way. So I don't know if he did that or not. Probably not because he's Jesus. But he does it. And the servants know they put water in the, the stone jars. Mary knows, Jesus knows, but I don't know if anybody else knows. And I don't know how long it took for people to find, find out. But here's something I want to say to us. We are constantly enjoying the best parts of life, and we don't even realize how it got to us. Jesus has intervened personally in our lives and we're experiencing the very best. We don't even know that he did it for us and we're not even giving him glory. Constantly. We have a tendency to look around at the stuff that's not going right and talk about that. But meanwhile, most of us are living a life that everybody else in the world would give their right arm for. Because we're so blessed, we take it for granted. And there's a constant flow of things in our lives that Jesus has given us personally because he loves us and he's blessing us and we're not even aware of his personal involvement and attention in my life. I don't know how many people left that gathering, that wedding giving praise to that married couple because you know Jesus didn't get up and say, hey, wine provided by Jesus of Nazareth, vineyards. You know, he didn't do that. So until the buzz got around, people would not have known. They would have given credit to that couple. And Jesus probably would have told them not to do the buzz and let the couple have the credit.
So it's important for us to understand that Jesus, before we ever came along, had already made provision to bless us. Remember? In that moment, he had a vineyard planted, grown at least 10 to 12 years for the grapes to be good for wine, picked them, crushed them, put them away for years to be the best wine available. All in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he made provision for them in that moment that stretched back decades to provide in this moment. We are walking around enjoying blessings that decades ago he set the stage for us to enjoy. And we're just like, duh. So the first sign, the first sign of what? The first sign that in the beginning, the Word created. The first sign, He's God Almighty. He's God Almighty. The first sign. This isn't, this, I mean, Oh, you're a leprous pulpit. Be clean. No more leprosy. That's enough to say you're God, probably. Or that you're connected to God. But to go back decades and plant a vineyard, let them ripen and mature for a decade or more, crush them, store them for a decade or more, maybe 50, 20, 50, 100, whatever, to make it the choice wine. Because they started with the choice wine available, and it totally obliterated that wine. Right? And so the provision is a sign. What's a sign? It's a, a sign is something that points at something, that gives you something that is necessary for the moment. Stop. Yield. Railroad. Although it could be Respus and Robertson. I'm not sure what it is. R&R. &R. Rest and relaxation. But a sign. He's God. He's God. He's God. The first sign. Right? Okay. So now we travel on. He's back in Cana of Galilee. People may or may not be aware of that story now. Could be that everybody in Cana of Galilee knows that Jesus did that. Could be that nobody knows, except a handful. But he's back in that place, and it's this place that something happens that John, the apostle, John, the revelator, John, the author of God, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said, second sign, second sign, second sign, there have been all kinds of signs up to this point. But he's saying this is a sign like that, and it's the second sign of that nature. Good? All that's just introductory. Let me check and see what time the Panthers play. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> so now let's pick up. John 2, 11, that's just to remind us, Cana of Galilee, the first sign, he's doing first sign. Notice again, this is important. What did John say about the sign? He said, this sign, the wedding at Cana of Galilee, revealed the glory of Jesus Christ. It was a revelation of his glory and who he was, and the disciples believed in him. I mean, it's one thing for Nathaniel to go, is there anything good that comes from Nazareth? And then Jesus to say, yeah, I saw you under that fig tree. And I'm going, <gasps> but then, you know, you get to the wedding at Canaan and Galilee, and that's like, that's over the top stuff, you know. So John 4, 45, when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover, for they had been there. Everybody goes up to Jerusalem for Passover. They saw what he did there. They were probably hitting each other and going, he was just in our town at a wedding. He was just, he was just there. You know, like they knew him because, you know, 
you want to act like you know famous people, right? You know, yeah, Jesus said, we're buds, man, we're buds. So, verse 46, once more he visited Canaan and Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Capernaum's not far away. You're going to see that this guy goes back to Capernaum. We're going to see in a second that it takes him a day to get there. Some people say, well, while he was in Cana, Galilee, he's a royal official, and he takes care of some business. But actually, the terrain, even though the miles are not far apart between Capernaum and Cana of Galilee, the terrain makes it a hard trip. And so it's not unusual for somebody to have to spend the night and get there the next day, even though the mileage isn't far. So when you're reading the footnotes in your Bible, you may actually have footnotes that say, oh yeah, the royal official did this or that or the other and just took his time because he was so sure in the word. Uh, but you may have a footnote that says, even though it was the day before, he had left and it was rough terrain and it took him a while to get back. You could have either of those footnotes. So, a royal official, most people take for granted this is a Gentile. You may also have a footnote in your Bible that says this was a Gentile because he's a royal official, but you may also have a footnote. I'm just telling you about footnotes. You understand? There's, there's the scripture, and then there are footnotes and commentary. Footnotes and commentary are about people, Right? So the footnotes and the commentary in your Bible are only as good as the Bible teachers who wrote them. The text is the text, okay? We try to figure out stuff about the text. And so if you've got a Bible scholar who's been doing this and walks with the Lord for like 85 years and he's writing the commentary, it's probably going to be better than somebody who just started and has a degree, you know? Okay, enough about that. I can see this is not really what you're interested in. So a royal official, he could be Jewish. It doesn't say he's not Jewish. But the likelihood is more likely that he's a Gentile. Matthew, or Levi, was a tax collector. Jewish people didn't like having a Jewish tax collector. Caused some ostracism, right? There's a royal official who serves probably Herod, the Tetrarch, who's called the king. And uh, he's probably Gentile, but he may, could be Jewish. But anyhow, he's got a son who's laying sick at Capernaum. And this guy, verse 47, heard Jesus was back in Galilee, which means he had heard what Jesus had done in Judea. Right. Or possibly the royal official had been in Jerusalem and had seen some of the things Jesus did. But obviously, if he hears that Jesus has arrived in Galilee from Judea, he knows what happened in Judea, and he sets off to find Jesus, and he begs him to come and heal his son. So whatever he saw in Judea, or whatever he heard about in Judea, was enough for him to believe that his son was not going to make it without Jesus and that Jesus was sufficient to deal with what was taking his son out. Good? So if Jewish, amazing. If Gentile, more than amazing. Right? He's going to go to this Jewish prophet for his son. So his son's close to death. Verse 48. And this is where Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. Now again, he just came from Samaria. Evidently, they were like believing just on the basis of what he was preaching. Right? Because we didn't see anything that said he was doing signs and wonders in Samaria. They were eating up what he was teaching, what he was saying, was bearing witness to them. And they were believing. And then he had just left a place that had demanded a sign in Jerusalem to prove who he was. And now he gets here and somebody else is tugging on him. And he says that thing, 
which may mean the royal official was Jewish, or it just may mean that as the guy's begging him, the crowd there is like salivating, whatever. But there's a reason Jesus says this. So the whole signs and wonders thing and believing. When is there enough signs and wonders? If you don't believe his word, when will you see enough signs and wonders to believe? A lot of people saw the crucifixion, but one Roman said, surely this man was the son of God. Others were mocking and insulting and spitting, but somebody there saw the same thing they saw and said, this man's the son of God. Peter and John ran to the tomb, but John looked at an empty tomb and believed. There's no evidence that Peter believed at the empty tomb. Jesus had a visitation with Peter. How can we see the same things and yet not everybody believes? How come some people can believe so quickly and some people, you show them things, you show them things, you show them things, and they just don't believe? Remember, there's a place where, where the rich man says, please send Lazarus back there in the grave to talk to my brothers. And Abraham says they've got Moses and the prophets. That's not signs and wonders. That's the word. The word is powerful enough that if you have no signs or wonders or miracles, the word is powerful enough to persuade those who are ready to believe. So Jesus says, Jesus says, the one who spoke wonders and the one who worked wonders. Said, all of, all of you want to see some more wonders, huh? You're on the wonder train, the wonder gravy train, so you can believe. Verse 49, I love this. I love this. Regardless of whether he's talking to the royal official or talking to the crowd, I love this. The royal official is undaunted. You know why, right? Because his kid's dying. He don't care what Jesus says. He just cares whether Jesus comes. Undaunted. Sir, sir, royal official, to a, especially if he's a Gentile, royal official to a Jewish carpenter, rabbi, preacher. Sir, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus says, go. I don't think it was like, I don't think it was like Peggy. Y'all know who Peggy is, right? I said Peggy already once. If you don't know who Peggy is, you'll know eventually. After I had sat there for an hour listening, listening, I don't know if any of y'all have ever done this, you say, can I go blank, blank, blank? It should be easy. Yes, no. Maybe. And instead, stories begin. And so, Danny, I remember there were, uh, our, you walked in our front door, the living room, you go straight ahead, double doors. This is a flashback for Lori and Beth. You're in the den with a kitchen, you can go down into the garage, or you can go up, and you go up, and there's a bathroom, bedroom, bedroom, bedroom. It's our house. How many times I sat on those little three steps that go up to the back part of the house while my mom, Peggy, is walking around telling me stories <laughs> that I can't tell if she's for me or against me. It's just I'm waiting to find out the bottom line. And if I wanted to be really bold, when she would pause for a very long time, I would simply say, so does that mean I can go or I can't go? <laughs> and eventually there would come that place where she would go, go, just go, 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 go. And I was gone, boy. Before she finished, I was gone, gone, I was gone. I don't think Jesus did that. 
I don't think he looked at the man and said, just go, go. I don't think he did that. But y'all understand the other thing, right? Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And nothing was done in the beginning without the Word. And he came and he tabernacled among us. And so this earthly tabernacle called Yahashua, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, speaks a word. He who is the living embodiment of the Word speaks a word and says, your son will live. In the same way he said, light be. And in that moment, that man took Jesus at his word, quickly believed, quickly took it. Now look, the mission was to get Jesus to come to his son. The mission was to beg Jesus to come to his son before his son died. The mission was to get Jesus from Cana of Galilee to Capernaum to be with his son before his son left the planet. But when Jesus said, go, your son will live, he took it, he received it, he apprehended it. It became something that was mass with weight and it was real to him, and he could stand on it. In the same way, a very foolish disciple in the midst of a storm said, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. And that word had mass and meaning and a surety, and was established. And with each and every step, steps rose to the surface that were sure and unshakable until that foolish disciple took his eyes off the one who spoke it and forgot the word that was spoken and began to look at what earth was saying to him. Do not. Here you go. It ain't over till it's over. Do not take your eye off what the Lord has shown you. Do not remove what the Lord has said to you and get your eye on what the earth is saying. So the man took what Jesus said. It was real to him. It was a Gibraltar. It was something he could stand on something he could, he could travel on. And so even though it wasn't going to be till the next day that he could get to his son and find out if the word was true, he just headed out because he believed it was true. So verse 51. Destination is 54 and it's 1155. Okay. While he was still on the way, from Cana to Capernaum, servants ran out to meet him with the news his boy was alive. His boy was alive. And evidently it wasn't running out to him to say, well, he's still alive, he's not died yet. Evidently he had recovered because they're running out to meet him and saying, he's alive. He's alive and well. He's good. The fever broke. The color returned. He's playing marbles. I don't know if they had marbles. <laughs> they didn't have video games, so I knew not to say video games. His boy was living. Can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine how that news hit his ears? Can you imagine how that news in his ears affected his heart? The boy that he thought was going to be dead was alive. 
And then he just had to ask. He just had to ask. When did the fever break? When did the color return? When did he jump out of bed and start playing? When did he want to eat? They said, one o'clock yesterday. Your footnotes, just your footnotes. If they're doing the Jewish thing, it's seven o'clock last night. So one o'clock, Jewish time versus Gentile, Roman time. So you could have a footnote saying a different time. One o'clock yesterday afternoon. The fever left him. And of course, you already know the next verse. Verse 53. The father realized. That's the exact time Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. But that's not the whole story. It's the exact time that Jesus said your son will live and he took that word and he believed that word and he put that word in his heart as a Gibraltar that was established, firmly established, without doubt because the one who said it, he esteemed greater than the one who had brought the disease upon his son. He esteemed the one who said it to be the word who in the beginning said, light be. He believed that word, and that word was real to him, and he went to see that word realized. He walked in the faith of that word from the time Jesus said it till he heard the news. He walked in faith on that word, believing it would come to pass. How many words are you walking on? You got a 22-year-old word that you're still walking on? We get so tired and we give up so quickly. It's not over till it's over. Keep walking on the word the Lord gave you. Keep standing on it. It's a surety. If the Lord said it, it's a surety. Do not give up. Do not get discouraged. Do not turn away. Do not start believing with the world. How many times do you think on that journey from Cana of Galilee to Capernaum that the devil came to that man and said, oh, he was almost dead when you left. What makes you think? You went to get Jesus to get him to come, and now you're not even returning. You failed. Do you think, do you think the devil left that man alone? Does he leave you alone when you get a word? If he doesn't leave you alone, he didn't leave him alone. The devil has, you know, this like M.O. You know it's the devil, right? Because he's got this reputation. He's got this habitual thing. He likes to lie. He wants to kill you. He wants to take things from you, right? He's always the same. Even when it sounds like he's telling you the truth, you know it's a lie. There's something in it that's wrong because it's him talking. And he's not just a liar. He's the father of lies. That means he's the source of every lie. He did not leave that man alone. But that man held on to the word and stayed focused on, the Lord, on that word from the Lord. And I bet you that word of the Lord kept him at perfect peace as he traveled that way. Because his mind was stayed on the word. Well, you can say, well, that scripture's mind stayed on the Lord. John's already said, the word is the Lord, and the Lord is the word. In the beginning was the word. You keep your mind stayed on the word, you've got your mind stayed on the Lord who said it. Twelve oh one, what in the world? Okay. And then he becomes the apostle to his household. 
he gets there and he shares this whole story and his whole household believes. When it says whole household, I don't think that's just his family, extended family in his household, but also the servants. There were servants that went out and told him. I think it's the servants too. It's everybody in his household. Everybody on his dime. Everybody he feeds believed. And then John just says, this was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. And, and let's just analyze. Jesus is in Cana of Galilee. Jesus says to a man, your son will live. And the man finds out the next day that at the moment Jesus said it, his son recovered. So that means for us today, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, but he can be here with me too. Because he was in Cana of Galilee, but he was also with that boy healing him at the same time. And that was when he was in an earthly tabernacle. How much more, now that he has his resurrection body, can he be at the right hand of the Father and also be here with me? How much more? There is no time, space, distance. He's God Almighty. He loves us. If that man was a Gentile, he loved that Gentile when his mission were to the lambs of God, the sons of Jacob or Israel. If that man was Jewish, he was under some ostracism by being royal official, and Jesus loved him. Jesus loved his child because that's who Jesus is. He loves people. When Jesus brings judgment, he doesn't want to take people out. He wants to free people to get saved. That's how he can say to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. That's not nice words. But Jesus, who knows minds and hearts, is trying to free them so they can be saved. Jesus is all about us getting saved. John 3, 16 and 17 is what it's all about. It's what it's about today. That's why uh-oh, 1204. You better start telling me the Panthers are getting ready to play because you don't <laughs> want me to get into this because I'll be meddling. That's why you cannot get on social media. You cannot get in relationships with friends and say things that's going to push people away because your objective as a Christian is to reach people for Jesus Christ. Your objective is to say things that bring them to Jesus. You don't have to agree with what they're doing. But your objective is to win people. Not pronounce judgment on people. When we pronounce judgment on people, we're sideways with Jesus because he's not pronouncing judgment on people. He's trying to save people. Ecclesia, church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's our fault that the things are like they are today because for too long we've said things that the world says, that the enemy says, that the devil says. When we've been called to hear what Jesus says and say what he says, we've been called to see what Jesus is doing and do what he's doing. He does not want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to be saved. We have to separate the principalities, the devil, the demons, the fallen angels, whatever you want to call them. We have to separate darkness from those who are being influenced by darkness. They must be free so they can be taken from darkness into his marvelous light, just like we were. Cannot let yourself get in that trap of speaking things over people, 
unless you're speaking what Jesus speaks over them. Can you imagine, I've said this before, can you imagine the testimonies of people today that are being controlled by darkness, the testimonies that will be there to win others, to do do-overs, because that's what testimonies are, do-overs. When that man testified to his family and they believed, there were do-overs set up for everybody they told the story to. Can you imagine the testimonies of people today that need to be free of the control and the influence of the devil? Truth is, I probably got a few places in my heart I need to be free of darkness. Okay, 12.07. Panthers are going to play at one. <laughs> I've done been meddling. I apologize. But this is really important because we're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ecclesia of the King of Kings. This is a kingdom where things operate by the word. So our words have to line up with the word to be who we're supposed to be in this earth because everything is sitting on our shoulders. Don't blame pundits. Don't play pollsters. Don't blame parties. It's our response. That's when judgment comes. It begins at the house of God because that's where the responsibility is for how things are going in the earth. Agree with the Lord. Agree with the Lord for good. Agree with the Lord that darkness be exposed and that the desires of God be established, that people be free of the influence of darkness, and that, be, that people be brought into his marvelous light, because it's a kingdom of light, a kingdom of life. John says that, chapter 1 as well. He's the light of man, he's the life, and he's called us to be the light and bring people into life. And that will be a sign. When we do that, we'll be holding. You seen the guy with the progressive sign? One of my favorite ones right now is the guy standing beside him and said, you're pointing that sign at me. So when people see your sign, they see my sign. And he goes, we're holding a sign. Where does our sign point? Our sign must point to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords the Savior of all mankind. Our sign has to point there and nowhere else. Good? I'm shutting up. So praise team can come up before I get lathered up again. Everybody on stage now? Young, young shared a video goes, come on, see a fat guy get all worked up. He's pointing and spitting and hollering. It's a show. Oh, Lord. We need you. Our eyes only see dimly and our ears hear as if through a muffle. And Lord, we need our eyes to see well and long. We need our eyes to see the very throne room of Abba. We need our ears to be trained on every word you speak. We need hearts of flesh that take the words that you say to us
and establish them as words that we can walk on and words that we can speak that will have power in life. So, Lord, today, we thank you that you so loved us, that you saved us, that you did not come here to condemn us or to judge us, but to save us and give each of us here life and life everlasting, true, real, abundant life, life beyond what the world has to offer us, and we confess freely that we have enjoyed the benefits of the life that you've given us. Forgive us for taking it for granted. And Lord, today as your ecclesia, we say that we want to hear well and see well so we can agree with you. Lord, we long to see people come out of darkness and into the light. We long for a great harvest and a great awakening. We long for a turning in our nation. Not just for our nation, but so that every nation on earth might see the glory of Jesus Christ. We agree with our ancient foundations. You've called us to be a place that's a beacon to the earth. A place of good news a place where people are raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and a place where the gospel is shared to the ends of the earth. Lord, today, we say yes and amen to every word you've spoken. Yes and amen to every desire that you have that you want to be established on the earth. We say yes and amen that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And today, as we gather around this table we eat this bread and we know that it represents your sacrifice your body that you gave freely for us and that by your stripes we were healed and we drink from this cup the cup of the new covenant in your blood and we thank you for redeeming us we thank you for life everlasting we thank you that you've made our sins though they were scarlet you've made them white as snow thank you that you've made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and thank you that you will meet with us now individually and corporately as we meet at this table we give you praise Lord we give you thanks and we pray it in your name Jesus amen after you partake you can stay and worship they'll be worshiping a while you can go to the prayer room or you can just go out and fellowship. Bless you. Thank you for being here.